the most expensive flight ticket in the world. In the so-called suite class of an Asian airline, you can fly from Singapore to New York for the incredible price of two small cars. But what do you actually get for the equivalent of 18,200 euros? I'm just psyched out. Reporter Carlotta takes a closer look at the flight in the ultimate luxury class. Usually I would have to queue up in there right now to fly with my economy class ticket. But you could say I've hit the jackpot because I am allowed to fly in the most expensive airline class in the world and they have their own check-in, of course. In the suite class, the all-round service starts as soon as you check in. Normally I don't get a cloth in my hand, nor am I taken care of so nicely. I'm just a classic economy class flyer and I'm speechless. No mass passenger handling. Here you take time for the wealthy customers. I could get used to this. This is the invitation to the private room. The private room is the airline's most noble airport lounge. But before our reporter is allowed to look around, she has to go through the security check. There are no queues at this security check. After two minutes, Carlotta is already on her way to the lounge. This is business class now, but I'm not there yet. Good afternoon. I'm right here. Yes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Carlotta now has just under an hour before departure and she intends to use it by exploring what the most expensive flight ticket can get you while you're still on the ground. I am so delighted to have received an invitation here. You can only come here if you're invited. It's all so exclusive here. You notice that only very few people sit here. Probably not that many people receive an invitation. Oh, and if you need a little more rest or something, there's a restroom here. One of the lounge's highlights, the bathroom. Oh my god, that's fantastic. A rain shower, you can fly around the world and come back here super fresh. You can take another shower and come out as neat as a pin. Before taking off, Carlotta treats herself to a luxury class burger in the lounge's own restaurant. Singapore's airport is one of the largest in the world. Here you may have to walk for 20 minutes to get to your gate. With a sweet class ticket in her hand, Carlotta is spared the walk. Amazing! I don't even have to walk to the gate now. I've never been driven at an airport before. But hey, if you fly sweet class, you'll get a ride to the gate. Awesome! Carlotta enters the suite class via a separate entrance. Should you have a seat here? Yeah, okay. thank you. And now it's getting really luxurious. Many airlines are competing for a particularly well-heeled clientele with luxury offers above first class. Where you could accommodate around 100 economy passengers, there are now 12 exclusive suites. And that has its price. Anyone who wants to sit here has to pay 18,200 euros per ticket. Hello, this is your seat for A. Wow. It's five fancy stuff for me online. Oh. All for myself? Yes. Just for myself. All for yourself and privacy. The windows. Uh, yeah. You can close up. Ta da! Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Very yeah. comfortable. This is your um, vanity mirror. So you can put anything that you want from here. Right? And of course, these are the entertainment. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. So luxurious, you don't even come close to describing what this aircraft or suite class has to offer here. A suite on the plane. That means three square meters, but every inch is used. As soon as the Airbus reaches cruising altitude, the suite class service will begin. My name is Kasim Marie. I'm the crew in charge today. Kasmeri is the chief steward. Thank you very much. That service, it knocks my socks off. I've never had anything like it before, and there's more. Champagne! Enjoy the drink. Thank you very much. Come back again. Thank you. 
Champagne. It's actually a little crazy. 12,000 meters above the clouds, I'm drinking champagne and sitting on an incredibly comfortable leather armchair. They're still not done. It's so absurd. Yes, hello. There's room on the plane for 12 suite class passengers, and they are looked after by a team of four. The economy and business class holds 397 passengers. One crew member is responsible for about 20 guests. Oh my God, this is so crazy. I'm starting to feel like a celebrity. I've always been happy to receive presents anyway, especially when they're so beautiful. This is great. What have we got here? A real perfume. And I'm not talking about a sample, I'm talking about a real perfume in a glass bottle. Lip balm, hand cream, just the things I need, as if they knew it beforehand. Almost mysterious. Cuddly luxury nightwear for a relaxed sleep above the clouds is available for free as well. Really comfortable sweatpants, perfect, as if they knew what kind of style I like. Carlotta is particularly taken by the headphones. Are they also included in the airfare of 18,200 euros? One question, is it allowed to keep this? This too is actually for each like ease. Good thing I asked. Don't want to end up stealing anything from the sweet class. I think I'll make myself comfortable now. No problem with this armchair. And it's got a footrest. It is absurdly great in this one. It's absolutely surreal. It feels a bit like I'm dreaming right now. I think I'd better get up again. With such an exclusive ticket price, you also get exclusive visits. How are you? I'm very fine. Hello. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have never been greeted by the captain himself on a plane. Oh God, I think I even blushed a bit. I have flown economy all my life. This room alone knocks my socks off. Now I have to choose a meal from a fancy menu that is completely leather-bound and I'm just psyched out. In the most expensive flight class, you can eat at any time. However, the choice is limited, because on board, you can only heat up and not cook. Carlotta puts her meal together. Two different starters, two soups, a salad, four main courses and two desserts. Appetizers, cheese and fruit are also included. Sounds good, but it also costs a lot of money. So, who can afford such a luxury trip? Carlotta has done some research. Well, that Leonardo DiCaprio was flying here as well. Yes. Unfortunately, I can't be watch because we have to protect uh, their privacy. Celebrity names must not be given away. I think that says it all. But Leonardo DiCaprio was here, 100%. Now, passengers in economy class are also getting their meal. Here, of course, they eat what's put on their folding tables. For our reporter, the culinary excursion begins with an appetizer. Now, for the first time in my life, I'm going to eat caviar. The airline serves one and a half tons of caviar to its VIP passengers every year. However, raw fish eggs are and will remain a matter of taste. It's definitely fishy, it's very salty and I think that's why I actually quite like it, which I didn't expect to be honest. The drinks served in the sweet class include four exclusive red wines, champagne, white and port wine. Carlotta stays with the champagne, with the soup and salad. Here's a mean course, a break of lamb with mean juice. Okay, okay now let's be honest. I've often eaten above the clouds, but nothing compared to this. And I just wonder how you managed to get such a meal onto a plane. And that's why I just had to see that for myself in Singapore. Before the flight, Carlotta had an appointment with Hermann Freidank. The catering chef is responsible for everything that this airline puts on the table. The catering company operates a special vacuum chamber to test the flavour of food under flight conditions. We simulate 30,000 feet. The whole thing takes 20 minutes for us to get up there, the door closes, it takes 20 minutes until the door opens again. So if you have to go somewhere quickly, you'd better go before we go in. <laughs> ah, OK, let's get started. On board an aircraft, the earthly kitchen rules no longer apply. Above the clouds, more salt and more sugar must be added to the food, but less acid and bitter substances. The taste changes in the air, of course. Why is that? 
The mucous membranes dry out after some time. Because it's hermetically sealed up here, humidity is below 10%. Is there any food that doesn't work at all in the air, that just can't be served at all? When it comes to pressure, it has more to do with taste and the fact that on long-haul flights, some things, like fine salads for example, just wilt because it's too dry. Some other things are not very good when you reheat them, which is what we have to do here. What food works really well above the clouds? Oh, goulash. Goulash is best. But a demanding clientele can't be fobbed off with goulash. That's why far more exquisite dishes find their way into the hot cabinet here. This is a dinner for the sweet class? This is a meal for the sweet class. This is also cooked here. And then it goes on board like this and is heated by the crew, who pay attention to the colour, which is very important, especially with greens, which easily loses its colour. So we cook it and put it straight into ice water to keep the colour. The tips and tricks of aircraft catering. The dishes for the premium class are not produced in the canteen kitchens of the economy and business class, but in their own premium kitchen. The food is taken out of the oven warm and put into a blast chiller. In other words, from 180 degrees C, the temperature goes down. So you can interrupt the cooking process and cook it spot on to allow for the heating up process. Because above the clouds, even luxury food has to be heated up. All this work, just so I can end up eating on the plane. And all that work is what Carlotta was able to enjoy just now. I am so full now that if I lay down, I would fall asleep immediately. So I'd better take a little digestive walk first. We're flying in an A380, which is a double-decker. I've never been on a plane with two floors. I really want to walk up a flight of stairs at 12,000 meters above the clouds. OK, so business class is luxury at its finest, but the contrast is pretty striking. There are four times as many people here compared to the sweet class. Carlotta's excursion into the world of luxury above the clouds is heading for its climax. Her suite is being transformed into a comfortable sleeping chamber. This can also be booked as a double bed, by the way. This plane is simply incredible. My God, I have a bed. Man, they just top everything. I'm going to throw on some sleepwear. I want to get into my bed. This is how you sleep in the luxury suite class, including slippers for your walk to the bedroom, you could say. I bet you I will sleep like a baby. Yes. Oh, yes, that would be great. And anyone flying celebrity style will also be put to bed by the stewardess. Good night and sleep well. Thank you. Carlotta only has a few more hours as a guest in the luxury suite and she wants to make the best of it. So I'll just say good night to you now. See you later. Shortly after sunrise, the research trip is almost over. I slept like a baby, as expected. It was just wonderful. But I was only a guest in the suite class, and now it's back to reality. And that means economy class. OK, so the contrast is even greater than expected. So many seats. OK, so it's three times as difficult to get into your seat in the economy class, although I have to say that this one is really comfortable. But compared to the suite class, it's a different world. Conclusion, you can fly like a prince if you pay the princely price. Exclusive service, your own suite with a bed. Champagne and delicious meals, though they are warmed up. Does this luxury justify the 18,200 euro price tag? This question is likely to remain a luxury problem. He calls the cockpit his home. Hamburg pilot Jochen Hergesell and she's been flying around the world for many years. Flight attendant Suela Bosse. They want to help us clear up a few myths about flying. 13 million Germans take to the skies somewhere in the world every month. 
and about 15% of them are afraid of flying. One reason for the fear of flying is superstition. These are your boarding passes for the return flight. A quarter of all German citizens say they're superstitious. To sit in the 13th row would be a catastrophe for these people. This is how flight myth number one comes about. Row 13 doesn't exist, does it? I think people are so superstitious that row 13 has been taken out, but I'm not sure. If you crash, it doesn't matter if you're in row 13 or 11, does it? I assume that the airlines don't necessarily take these myths into account and end up taking rows out. No, there is no 13, is there? Yes, this myth is true. I can confirm that. You can see that quite clearly here. We have a row 12 and a row 14. The 13 is completely missing, which is the case with almost all European airlines, because many people react superstitiously to the number 13, especially when they're travelling. So it really is true that there is no row 13. And some airlines also cater for travellers from other cultures, because row 13 is not something everyone is afraid of. Different countries, different fears. In fact, we don't have a row 17 either, because in Brazil and Italy the number 17 is an unlucky number. So neither row 13 nor row 17 can be the cause for any superstition-based anxiety here. Two million people take off and land at German airports every month. There are around 10,000 pilots and 5,000 co-pilots in Germany. They take their meals on the plane, as do the passengers. Many people think that this is a risk. After all, pilots carry a lot of responsibility for the passengers and the expensive aircraft, costing up to 100 million euros. This is how flight myth number two comes about. Pilot and co-pilot have to eat different meals. Is this true? Yeah, because you don't really know if someone's put anything into the food. So it's important that the co-pilot and pilot eat separately so they can be sure. I think they're obliged to eat different dishes. I once saw it in a film some years ago when they ate the same menu, fish, and they were both poisoned and ended up unconscious. This myth is not true, even if it's shown in an old film. But we pilots are free to choose what we eat, and whether we eat the same or not is always up to us. The problem of being ill from food poisoning quite simply no longer exists, because the food chain is so well protected that you can be sure that the food is OK. So, this myth is not true. The doors on the plane work via a hydraulic system. They are the entry and exit doors, but also the emergency exit. Because short-haul aircraft make around 75,000 flights in their lifetime, doors open and close up to 600,000 times during this period. The exits are built into the fuselage and always have to work smoothly. But what happens when the aircraft is flying at around 800 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 10,000 meters? Can the doors be open during the flight? Yes or no? You'd have to be pretty strong. But I think you'd have to open some kind of lock, but I don't think it opens during the flight. We don't sit near the door, we fasten our seatbelts, as long as we don't get sucked out when the door opens. This myth is not true. The doors can't be opened during the flight because they are so-called plug-in doors, which means that basically every aircraft door is in essence a part of the fuselage and due to the cabin pressure you would have zero chance of opening the door at all during the flight. You'd need about 100 bodybuilders and even then I don't think it would work. It can't be done. So, the myth is not true. At an altitude of 10 kilometers, the outside air pressure is only a quarter of the pressure on Earth. But inside the machine, the air pressure is similar to that on the ground. 
That's why opening the door at an altitude of 10,000 meters is as difficult as trying to move eight tons. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to ask you to switch off any electronic devices. This also applies to mobile phones, which should not be switched on until you arrive at your final destination. Until 2013, you would be fined for using a mobile phone on a plane. Perhaps this is what led to flight myth number four. Mobile phones can cause a plane to crash. With mobile phones, you don't exactly know what the consequences will be in the end. But I turn mine off because I don't want anything to be my fault. Once I forgot to turn my iPad off and the plane arrived anyway, so it must be OK. You're supposed to turn it off, but I doubt whether this could cause a crash. Yes, you can set off an explosion with a mobile phone like a bomb. So I think it's possible. This myth is not true. A mobile phone definitely can't cause a plane to crash. But what is true is that they've noticed it does interfere with the radio communication and it's actually quite annoying when you're sitting next to a passenger who's just talking on the phone all the time. And that's actually the main reason. So this myth is not true. Since 2008, airlines can allow their guests to use technical devices and each airline decides for itself whether to sanction mobile phone use or not. Most accidents happen during landing. Worldwide, around 600 people die in aircraft accidents every year. In comparison, 1.2 million people worldwide lose their lives in traffic accidents every year. And yet, many people are afraid of planes crashing. Flying myth number five. If you're in a plane crash, you have no chance of survival. We'll be flying at a height of 10 kilometers. We're going to the Canary Islands. We won't get out of there alive if it crashes. If anything does happen, then it's usually a big deal. There's been a landing on the Hudson River before. That plane crashed too. I suppose if you've got a guardian angel or something, I'd survive anyway. I've got seven lives. This myth is not true. Even if an engine should fail, you can still carry on flying for quite some time. The pilots are so well trained that they are also well prepared for all emergency situations. Basically, it can be said that traveling by plane is definitely the safest means of transport in the world. The most dangerous part of the journey is definitely the trip to the airport. So the myth isn't true. For example, the A320 can still fly a full 153 kilometers without engines. And one more tip. It's definitely advisable to pay attention to the safety precautions and measures the flight attendant shows you before takeoff. Then you are very well informed and will know what to do in case of an emergency. And who would have guessed? The probability of being involved in a serious accident on a plane is one in 100 million. Apple, orange or tomato juice? A major airline serves around 1.7 million litres of tomato juice in German planes every year. What can I offer you to drink? A tomato juice, please. OK. Yummy, 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 I got love in my tummy and I feel like I'm loving you. Would you like salt and pepper? Yes, please. One in four passengers asks for tomato juice with salt and pepper at an altitude of 33,000 feet. Flight myth number six. Tomato juice tastes better on board than on the ground. We asked the passengers. Yes, definitely. I'll have tomato juice again today. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I need it every time. Maybe it's because of the salt and pepper, the spices perhaps. It always tastes good up here. I think it's because the air is very dry and because certain taste receptors work differently. Well, I don't like it personally, but I can confirm that my husband only asks for it in the air, so I think it must taste better somehow. Yes, this myth is true, because in the air the sense of taste of every person changes, and of course tomato juice also tastes different due to the change of molecules in the air. 
So, for example, food that tastes very salty on the ground tastes milder in the air, and that's why many people like tomato juice a lot more up here. So, this myth is true. On the plane, you don't notice aromas as much. Fruity odors and sweet cooling flavors are intensified. On the ground, tomato juice doesn't get such a good rating and is drunk far less often. And once one guest starts to ask for it, the others want it too. This is no different in the air or on the ground. We've heard rumors of a mysterious Boeing in a forest. But in order to find it, we first have to get on a plane ourselves and fly to Hillsborough, west of Portland. The passenger plane is supposed to be here, in the forest, at the end of this forest road. We feel a little uneasy. Are we still in the right place? But then we see it, standing there in the middle of a clearing. It almost seems as if someone has parked the plane between the trees. It appears completely intact. Nothing suggests it's crashed. But what has happened here? Bright LED displays and flashing wing lights are not what we expected. The place does not seem to be abandoned. The aircraft stairs have been extended. We venture into the interior of the strange Boeing. Our arrival does not go unnoticed. Nice to meet you. Hi, it's so good to meet you. Thank <laughs> you for having in. us. Yeah, my pleasure coming inside. Wow, look at this. This must be your home. This is it's my so home. Good. And suddenly, we're standing in the owner's kitchen. Bruce Campbell is just warming up his lunch in the microwave, just as you would expect on a plane. The Boeing and the huge forest around it belong to him. Reminds me a little bit of camping. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it has that flair to it all the time. And um, in some regards, either because I'm rationalizing or um, because it does make some sense, I sort of like that. I, I don't know whether it's a genuinely good idea to get too comfortable as a human being. But Bruce Campbell is not on a camping trip. He lives in this passenger plane and he does so all year round. A standard of living that actually seems anything but comfortable. For example, there's no heating here. This thermal wall is only in place during the winter. During the summer, all three sections of this are removed, and now we have the forward section. The central heating to this exclusive home is currently being planned. Bruce has been living in the 99-square-metre Boeing since 2004 and has been constantly adapting it to his lifestyle and habits. But now, his living room is his bedroom. His kitchen leads directly into the bathroom. Conveniently, the wings of his apartment can be used as terraces in the summer. This, this is the aircraft during its service days. So that's what it looked like when it was intact and healthy. So this is this exact aircraft. Yeah. Built in 1969, the Boeing 727 belonged to a Greek airline at that time. It successfully completed over 40,000 flights. Well, now we're going to the flight deck. The flight deck is still in its original condition. So there's the captain, the first officer, and a flight engineer. In 1999, Bruce saved the Boeing from being scrapped. For around 88,000 euros, he bought the discarded aircraft from a collecting society. He invested another 100,000 euros to transport the 47-meter-long and 33-meter-wide machine to his property. Incidentally, it's also possible to live in a plane in Germany. The only condition is that there must be no more oil or kerosene in the machine. My vision was to have a complete aircraft. I really wanted a complete aircraft. My, my sense is that everyone's feeling ultimately is that we should reuse whatever we can, particularly if it's something of a treasure. 
and uh, jet liners certainly qualify. They, they were enormously expensive. They're all enormously expensive when new. They're, they're difficult to build, and uh, they represent treasures of, of human resource. Bruce is a trained electrical engineer and is convinced of his living concept. In his opinion, a Boeing brings almost everything you need to live. But what is everyday life like? Just a glance into Bruce's bathroom makes it clear he has an affinity towards nostalgia. Apart from the toilet seat, all these things here are the original furnishings. It's a normal aircraft lavatory with normal aircraft lavatory latch, which activates the lights. Of course, there was no shower in the plane, so Bruce had to come up with something special. What started as a temporary solution has turned out to be quite practical. So I simply shower and I duck down when I need to wash my head and hair and, and everything above this level um, so that the water doesn't spray all over the place. And I found that comfortable over the years and, and I, I think I found it comfortable from the very first. Bruce gets the water from his own groundwater spring. The unsecured power cables right next to the open shower cubicle don't worry him. Well, it hasn't been so far. Either I've been lucky or uh, more likely, I think, there's uh, nothing about these systems which is terribly water sensitive, primarily because they're low in voltage. This was a connection to the personal service units. So this particular harness provided reading lights, and the signal to drop the oxygen masks. Bruce would like to leave the plane in its original condition as far as possible. He's only added minor modernizations, such as a telephone and internet connection for his own comfort on board. He also installed a hot water boiler in the rear part of the cargo compartment. A clever move by the electrical engineer, as it helps to stabilize the aircraft's stance on the ground. It's an appropriate location because it's, it, for, for this particular aircraft, it's best to keep as much mass aft as possible. Okay. Um, the removal of the engines resulted in uh, a different weight and balance for the aircraft. So um, putting mass aft in about the vicinity of the engines tends to rebalance it back to its, its natural balance, and that's what I want. Bruce's Boeing house, quite literally, doesn't have a leg to stand on. Did you measure all of this? Like how high those wood pieces had to be for it to be straight? No. No, <laughs> no not yet. And it's on my immediate agenda. Today, Bruce knows temporary solutions are difficult to change later. When Bruce bought his aircraft, it was in a worse condition than he first thought. Because of this, the conversion work ended up exceeding his budget. His bird, as he affectionately calls his Boeing, is nevertheless his absolute passion. It's not really beautiful. It has lots of scars and lots of work in progress, and it's been 16 years into the project. But I do like my bird, I love my bird, but I know that there are bigger things to be done. So um, I'm happy with my bird, but I want a second bird. I, I want to demonstrate to the world that there's an efficient, elegant, and beautiful way to execute this kind of project with a result which will be really compelling. And Bruce also wants to convert his second bird so that he can use it as a fully-fledged home. After all his experience with the first plane, he now knows how best to do it. This way, something old and supposedly unusable can now be turned into something very special.